what's good, TMG fam? It's your boy, L, and I'm back with another reaction. How y'all feel? Welcome back to the channel. Salute. So listen, back to these cases, bro. The next video is five cold cases solved in 2020. Now, just because it was solved in 2020, you know these cases could be 5, 10, maybe even 15, 20 years old. You know what I mean? And I was sitting back thinking about that the other day, bro. Back in the day, it was some people getting away with some stuff, man. Like, without the technology that we have today to be able to assist and help solve these murders and solve these files, like, they didn't have that back then, so people was getting away with just pure madness back then. It was crazy, bro. Y'all was really living, some of y'all was really living in, like, the wild, wild west, bro. It's literally. Crazy. But uh, we're going to check this video out, man. Shout outs to uh, Explore With Us. Make sure y'all go subscribe to them and show them some love, all right? So if you're new to the channel, make sure you hit that subscribe button. Join the fam. Once you join the fam, man, we just need you to do a few things. One, for the haters, moment of silence. That's enough. Now, run the likes up, baby. Make sure you run the likes up. Hit that like button. Let's go. What is up, Ewu crew? Today, we're covering five cold cases finally solved in 2020. Let's get right into it. Number five, Esther Lucille Westenbarger. Little was known about Esther Lucille Westenbarger and the circumstances surrounding her disappearance in 2009. Last seen on November 12th at around 1.30 a.m., the 51-year-old Ohio native had headed out bar hopping with some new friends. With her car parked nearby, her final stop was at Miller's Tavern before she walked out the doors, never to be seen again. The friends that were with her assumed she'd gone back to where her car was parked, near the Hoosier bar, nothing suspicious about her actions. Having moved to Kokomo, Indiana, only a month earlier, to be closer to her family, nobody could have anticipated her disappearance. A beloved mother and grandmother, her children vowed to search for her until she came home. When the alarm was raised, her car was also found to be missing from the scene. With a custom license plate reading MS Esther, the vehicle was uniquely identifiable. At first, there were theories of foul play, but with no answers, some began to wonder whether Esther would ever be found. Almost 11 years later, there was a breakthrough the Howard County Dispatch Center received a call on June 17th, reporting what seemed to be an algae-covered vehicle at the bottom of a retention pond. The caller had been fishing in the area when they spotted it, and authorities were quick to respond. After arriving at the scene, they requested assistance from the county's dive team to pull the vehicle from the water. Just as the caller had reported, an algae-covered vehicle was pulled from the bottom of the pond, with a single occupant still sat inside of it. Oh. The license plate matched that of Esther's vehicle, and it was later confirmed to be the same golden 2005 Cadillac CTS that had disappeared with her. On June 19th, an autopsy was performed by a forensic pathologist, concluding that the body likely belonged to Esther Lucille Westenbarger. No foul play was suspected, and an investigation is still underway. The leading theory is that she accidentally drove into the retention pond that night, though little else is known about her disappearance beyond that. Whether it was the few drinks she reportedly had, or just a tragic accident, we may never know. But after almost 11 years of searching, her family finally knew what had happened to her. Number four. So I'll be saying, man, you like, have you a drinking buddy? Uh, somebody that you go out with, man. You know what I mean? Don't be out here traveling alone or being by yourself. And, and definitely don't be trying to drive home. Sound like she got a little too tipsy, a little too wasted. 
no judgment because we've all been there and tried to drive home. You know what I'm saying? And before she knew it, she was. And what's crazy is the fact that nobody saw it. You would hope somebody would see, you know, a car running off the road, you know, down an embankment into a retention pond or something. You would hope somebody would see that. Michelle Martinko. <laughs> it's December 19th, 1979. And Michelle Martinko had attended a banquet for her concert choir. A multi-talented student, she was active in various choirs and theater groups, notably a member of a twirling squad. 18 years old, she was excited to attend university with plans to study interior design. When the banquet had wound down, she asked if one of her friends would like to go to the local mall with her, though her friend declined. It had only opened a few months earlier, though she had a job there, so felt happy to go alone. With almost $200 with her, she spoke to friends she knew from working there as she looked for a new winter coat. Last seen around 8 or 9 p.m. that night, her father called to report her missing at 2 a.m. the next morning. Police were quick to search for her alongside her father, and by 4 a.m. the family car had been discovered in the car park. Inside of it, Michelle was collapsed over the passenger seat, curled up onto the floorboards of the car. Covered in almost 30 stab wounds, she was found to have fought back against her attacker, with her hands bearing defensive wounds. Analysis of the scene concluded that she had likely been killed inside the car between 8 and 10 p.m. that night, though they were unable to find any fingerprints at the scene. This suggested that her killer had worn gloves and had not attempted to rob her due to the cash still being inside of her purse. These findings led police to feel that the killing was personal instead of a spontaneous crime committed by a stranger. This lead didn't help with the investigation due to a series of failures throughout. Tips weren't passed on to police correctly leaving one tip unreported by the daughter of the public safety commissioner for five months after the murder. This tip could have solved the case far earlier, with a man spotted beside the open door of Michelle's car at 2 a.m., his car nearby. In late June 1980, a composite sketch of the suspect was created with the help of two witnesses under the effects of hypnosis. Though this sketch never helped to identify the suspect, it prompted hundreds of interviews by police, with an estimated 30 of those interviews being performed with the help of hypnosis. The case went cold in the mid-1980s, no answers in sight. Her father passed away in 1995, her mother in 1998, though her sister Janelle continued to fight for answers. In 2006, 27 years after Michelle had been found dead, the case was reopened after the killer's blood was found in the case files. This allowed them to create a partial DNA profile, allowing them to clear approximately 60 of the 80 suspects they had at the time. What they do with DNA these days, bro? You can't tell me they just can't go ahead and just create a person out of just some DNA. I, I, you can't convince me otherwise. Despite their progress, they were unable to match the killer's <laughs> DNA to anybody in the National DNA Database. And the case went cold for a further 11 years. This changed in 2017, when a company created an image of the potential killer an image that looked vastly different from the original 1980 composite sketch. Instead of a white man with curly brown hair and brown eyes, the man instead seemed to be blonde with blue-green eyes. Alongside that image, they produced an age progression of the suspect, 
And when released to the public, over 100 new tips came in. One of Michelle's classmates claimed that it looked just like another of her classmates, though that classmate had been cleared in 2006 after a DNA swap. Only a year later, the data was placed into GED Match, a genealogy tool frequently used in cold cases, and were quickly pointed in the direction of three brothers. All three had grown up in Manchester, Iowa, and police soon placed them under surveillance. This surveillance involved attempting to discreetly collect a DNA sample, something they achieved in October of that year. Jerry Lynn Burns' downfall had been a straw. When the straw was disposed of, it became public property, allowing investigators to collect and later test it, clearing his two brothers and confirming that the blood at the crime scene belonged to him. On December 19, 2018, authorities approached Jerry at his business to interview him. Though he refused to provide DNA, a search warrant was quick to change his mind. When Michelle was mentioned, he vehemently denied knowing her, though he never said that he didn't kill her, unable to come up with a reason for his DNA being at the scene of the crime. Emotionless during his interview, when asked if he killed anybody on December 19, 1979, he repeatedly told investigators to test the DNA. This DNA sample also matched the blood at the crime scene. Exactly 39 years to the day of Michelle Martinko's murder, Jerry Lynn Burns was arrested and charged with her murder. Finally, on February 24, 2020, he was found guilty of first-degree murder, a crime that mandates a life sentence without parole. Speaking after his conviction, Janelle spoke freely of her grief. Her mother missed her, her father was angry, and she felt a profound sadness. Though she was happy that there had finally been a conviction, it was an ambivalent situation, and she wished their parents had been able to get the answers they deserved. Number 3. Karen Spencer Karen Spencer was only 12 when she went missing from Fairhaven, Virginia on November 29, 1972. With plans to borrow a book from her classmate, she disappeared that evening, never to be seen alive again. Only a few days later, on December 2nd, a group of boys were playing in a local park. Under a pile of leaves, they discovered her body carefully concealed. That's all that was known about the case for many, many years. With several persons of interest, but no real evidence, the case quickly went cold, leaving Karen's family without answers. One of those persons of interest was James Jimmy Edwards. Believed to have been Karen's boyfriend, he was 16 when she was murdered. Despite countless interviews, he maintained his innocence right up until his death in 1997. It took over 20 years for friends to speak out against him with their stories, ones that had been told in the early 90s without hesitation. Two acquaintances of his were able to recount a time he'd confided in them, telling them that he'd killed a girl and buried her in a field when he was a teenager. This information, combined with various tips and previous findings spanning nearly five decades, helped to dis- How do you have that information about your friend and don't say nothing? How? I know everybody want to say, oh, I was scared, or I get that to a certain extent, but bro, how do you sleep at night? Qualify many of the other suspects in the case. Despite dying in 1997, police concluded in December 2019 
that if he were still alive, they would have a strong enough case against him to charge and prosecute him in relation to Karen Spencer's murder. In 2020, authorities stated the case was now solved. Though he isn't around to face the consequences of his actions, nor to provide closure to the many people impacted by the case, he is nonetheless considered a killer. For almost five decades, the case was investigated with unrelenting dedication. The investigation always focused on finding answers for Karen and her family, providing them with the closure they deserved. With the help of devoted detectives and a compassionate community, the residents of Fairhaven were finally able to close the case and allow Karen to rest in peace. Number 2. Billy Feigner October 27th, 1985 In a field in Texas, beside State Route 51, skeletonized remains are found by a father and son. Buried in a shallow grave, haphazardly covered by foliage, the area had been partially dug up by animals. With jeans and a jacket found strewn across the area, these were some of the only clues they had. Little was able to be gleaned from the remains, though a 1984 coin found with the remains led investigators to conclude that he'd likely passed away between 1984 and 1985. With incomplete remains, it was hard to determine an exact age, eventually placing him between 14 and 21 years old when he died. Having seemingly been shot to death, the death was a violent one, and without the extensive DNA technology we now have, it was impossible to identify him. The case flew under the radar with ease, and it wasn't until 2018 that his DNA was analyzed in a bid to more accurately determine certain characteristics. This analysis contradicted previous beliefs that the victim was of mixed race, instead concluding that the victim was white. Since 2000, there had been further research into the case, but no matter the leads that were chased, nothing came of it. So the analysis of DNA was the key to finding the answers. With fair skin, dark hair, and eyes, and predominantly European ancestry, reconstructions were created and distributed. Colored 3D reconstructions generated no leads, but prompted further genetic genealogy exploration. Over 18 months, there were attempts to find first and second cousins. The ones that were found later turned out to be adopted into their families, changing the direction of the case. Instead of trying to match the victim to the adopted family, one of the adopted cousins came forward with a theory about his biological father. After finding he was deceased, authorities reached out to one of his biological sons in a bid to find DNA. This DNA confirmed that the victim was a first cousin to the family, and this confirmation allowed authorities to explore the family tree. Searching for a young man between 14 to 21 years old, they located a New Yorker who'd gone missing in his 20s. Billy Feigner was born in Brooklyn, dying at just 22 years old. When investigators connected with his family, they were quick to gather DNA samples. DNA samples that confirmed it was Billy who had been found all those years ago. Hurricane Sandy had destroyed many of the photos of him. The only one that remained was from years earlier. Instead of the grown man in the facial reconstructions, he was a blonde-haired schoolboy sitting for a grade school photograph. His parents had sent him to work on a horse ranch in California after his previous behavior spiraled out of control. But never heard from him after he left. The desire to find answers sent investigators to California, and they finally uncovered 
the fate of Billy Feigner. Billy had arrived at the ranch and eventually struck up a friendship with a man by the name of Forrest Ethington. Ethington had been constructing crews to complete coin heists, not just in California, but around the country. The pair completed many of these heists successfully, before Billy eventually decided to fly solo. Without the help of his friend, he was quickly caught, and this concerned Ethington. He was paranoid that Billy would snitch on him, and came to the conclusion that he needed to be silenced. Ethington was open about his desire to silence Billy. When he marched him to the back of the Texas ranch they were on and shot him once in the back of his head, nobody was surprised, and investigators were finally prepared to charge him with the murder. Tragically, only a month earlier, Forrest had died of a heart attack in prison. The case was finally solved in 2020 after 35 years, giving closure to investigators. But the man responsible had escaped by just the skin of his teeth. Number one, Jennifer Saw. Wow, now, 30 something years and it gets solved, bro. So that I just say that for those families out there who still need closure, you know what I'm saying? It's possible, bro, it's possible. You know what I mean? Just keep having the faith. And I know that's easier said than done, especially when it's your family member that's, you know what I mean, was murdered or whatever. However, it's tough to say that. So I know if I was in somebody else's shoes and and the killer would still be out there, I'd be feeling some type of way too. It's December 4th, 2008 in Horry County, South Carolina. A branded tote bag is found in the woods by utility workers. Inside of that bag was a blanket wrapped around an infant. Tragically, the infant was no longer alive, and locals were left reeling after hearing the news. South Carolina had a safe haven. Now, if that don't piss you off, you ain't human right there, bro. I, I felt myself clinch, like just clenching my hands, just getting law in place. A law that allowed children under 30 days old to be left at a hospital, fire station, or church without the risk of prosecution. When it was discovered that the infant, referred to by locals as baby boy Ori, had been born alive and could have survived with medical intervention, so many were confused. Believed to have lived only a day before passing away, the circumstances of death were unclear. Only miles away from one of the many safe havens in the area, there was heartbreak over the death. DNA tests were performed in a bid to find the child's mother, but she was never identified. After two weeks, a funeral was held, attended by over 100 people, all of whom were deeply invested in the case. Pleas were made by police and substantial rewards were offered, but nobody came forward. As the years passed, memorial services were held. Baby boy Ori was still remembered by the community. Born in December, many expressed sadness that he never had the chance to experience his first Christmas. That was until almost 12 years later. On March 3rd, 2020, Jennifer Saar was charged with homicide. Though police haven't revealed how they connected her to the case, she was studying at Coastal Carolina University at the time of the discovery. Now living in Pensacola, Florida, she was married with two young children at the time of her arrest. You got the- A nationwide war- You got the audacity, the audacity. Wow. Wow, I can't wait to hear your charges. Warrant was put out for her, and there was an attempt to arrest her at her home, though she was nowhere to be found. Instead, she had driven herself back to Horry County, handing herself in for a controlled arrest with the assistance of her attorney. With DNA evidence supposedly tying her to the case and confirming that she was the biological mother, there's very little known 
about the circumstances of baby boy Ori's death, only that she was likely responsible for leaving his body behind. Though Jennifer Saar neglected to give her son the dignity he deserved, the county rallied together to memorialize baby boy Ori. With the yearly memorials, a proper funeral, and the love of the community he was adopted into in lieu of a family of his own, nobody was willing to stop fighting for him. Authorities that worked on the case were unwilling to retire without answers, and would frequently walk past the scene just in case they'd missed something. Locals spoke of him like family, gathering to remember his all-too-short life. And discovering the person responsible for his death, he can finally rest in peace with the justice he deserved. If you enjoyed this- Yo, strangers and outsiders should never have more love and compassion for your child than you do, bro. Like, I always say this, bro. Children didn't ask to be here. A child didn't ask to be here. He didn't even get a proper shot at life. And you treated him like he was just a throwaway doll. And then you want to go down and move away and have this life like nothing ever happened. Nah, man. No. Don't feel sorry for you at all. Do y'all? I didn't think so. I, I don't need to hear it. I know y'all didn't. That's crazy. Y'all get at me in the comment section, man. Five cold cases solved in 2020, man. Some crazy people out here. Some weird people out here. And a, a lot of them shouldn't have kids. I'm going to leave it at that. It's your boy L. To the next reaction of my piece. Y'all stay silent. Hey.